I'm about to do a matter of Jacob. I will be taking you on what we call constitutional development, post 103. In this course, you will be exposed to know the rudiments of what constitution are. How does constitution emerge? The Nigerian constitution you see today, that is about 160, 176 pages, does not emerge from the blues. So what the course will do for you is to arm you with the prerequisite. How has the Nigerian constitution emerged? Constitution is a product of historical antecedents. The state-to-stage -stage progress, the state-to-stage -stage involvement of citizens and stakeholders in the development of the Nigerian constitution. So basically, this course is historical to explain, to discuss the state-to-stage -stage metamorphosis of the Nigerian constitution. So first and foremost, it's important that the beginning of this journey of the Nigerian constitution began in 1914, the Nigerian Council. Then you have the Clifford Constitution of 1922. Then you go to the Richard Constitution of 1946, the Mark Fessing Constitution of 1951, and Linton Constitution of 1954. You talk about the constitutional conferences in 1958, 1959 in London, and the 1960 Independence Constitution. From there, we move further to the Independent Constitution of 1963, the 1979 Constitution and what we have today as 1999 constitution. So ladies and gentlemen, I implore you to follow the progress, the step-by-step -step development of the Nigerian constitution. It's basically historical. The course is a historical study of the Nigerian constitution. How the Nigerian constitution has metamorphosed. It begins by conceptual clarification. What is a constitution? Discuss what is constitution, what is constitutionalism, what are the sources of constitution, types of constitution, and as I've said before, you go to the 1914 Nigerian Council, the Clifford Constitution, the Richard Constitution, the Littlinger Constitution, the Independent Constitution of 1960, and we go on and on. Then, what is constitution? The constitution is a body of rules. A body of norms, values, attitude, behavior that is operational within a state is a kind of a grand norm, a document that contains the rules, the do's, the don'ts, obligations, responsibility, guiding the operationality of every nation state. It's equally applicable to association. So every association Every community, every state has its own constitution. It could be either written or unwritten. But the guidelines that guide conduct, character, is what we call constitution. Basically, a constitution is a body of rules, norms that guide the operation of a nation, state, or association. It is an institutional framework that spells out the rules, rights, obligations, and responsibilities of every citizen. The basic rules that forms any nation constitution can be found in various sources. What are the sources of constitution? Number one, we have a written document. A constitution is a product of written documents. A constitution is a product of histories of a particular group of people. A constitution is a document containing activities of the past. How do we want to be governed? How do we want our conduct to be organized within the confines of the law? So basically, one of the major sources of constitution are written documents. Written documents in the past histories. Written documents in norms, culture, values, attitude that are acceptable within that particular culture. Two, you go to organic laws. Every aspect of the modern constitution cannot be outlined in a single document. These gaps are usually filled by organic laws. Organic in the sense that they are living. Organic in the sense that they are current. For example, you take the British constitution, for example. Contains laws, the Magna Carta, the Habeas Corpus Act. All these are issues that are raised 
in the constitution but not written. There are guidelines. There are code of conduct. They are contained principles that guide the Britain's system of government, but this part of this constitution might not be written. For example, the Habeas Corpus of 1679, which confirmed the citizen's right to protection against imprisonment without any cost. The Bill of Rights of 1689 and the Act of Settlement of 1710. All these are part of the British constitution, but they are not codified in a single document. Judicial interpretation or what you might call judicial precedent. Cases that have been decided in the past. Judgment that have been given in the past. Experiences, interpretations that are judicial in nature and now value to the current society are being co-opted into the national constitution. There are experiences, there are pronouncements that were not earlier written in the constitution but because of the exigencies and necessity of it, it is being co-opted in subsequent amendments and reforms. And that's why we talk about judicial interpretation. Naturally, constitution and organic law are usually written to some extent in ambiguous languages. Many of these languages must be interpreted and reinterpreted to have meaning. Therefore, judicial interpretation forms a major source of part of the 1999 constitution as we have in Nigeria today. You also have philosophical thoughts. Every constitution is a reflection of its immediate socio-political environment. The framers of this constitution draw from their unique experiences. For example, Plato. Aristotle studied 158 constitutions of the world. From there, we have forms of government. What we have today as democracy was a product of this philosophical thought. What we have today as oligarchy was a product of philosophical thought. Because Aristotle is they took time to study, to go into the activities of nation state. Why do you behave the way you behave? Why do you conduct yourself in this manner? Why do you allow an emir or an oba to rule you as your number one head? Why do you surrender your sovereignty to a group of people? These are questions Aristotle asked. And based on this, he was able to understand that society does not just exist, but they are guided by a constitution. From this study, he was able to give us what we have today as forms of government. So majorly, philosophical thought is a major source of constitution. Then you have custom and conventions. Customary laws are rules, norms, values that are generally clearly understood, accepted by the people form part of their constitution. In Africa, we have our norms. In Nigeria, every society has its rules, its conduct, conduct, attitude, behavior, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. All these form part of our constitution. Obviously, in Nigeria, every culture knows it is not acceptable to steal. Stealing is not part of our culture. So when you steal, you have to go beyond the line. Then you need to be punished. So norms, attitude, Character, acceptable behavior over the years has now co-opted into the constitution. Another major source of the constitution is experience. Every constitution is of its, every constitution is a reflection of its immediate socio-political environment. The framework of every constitution draw from the unique experiences of the history of its people. Nigeria, for example, has a military history. Nigeria, for example, has a history of military incursion and power. And it was spelled out clearly in 1999 constitution that military intervention is outlawed, is an aberration, is not allowed, it is not acceptable. Nigeria wouldn't have co opted that into the 1999 constitution if we have not had a military experience. So, for a soldier man in Khaki to decide within his whims or his beliefs that, oh, I'm taking over power in Nigeria today, is already outlawed, it's illegal. Is not allowed, it's unpopular based on experiences. Types of constitution. When you talk about types of constitution, you talk about written and unwritten constitution. When you classify constitution based on written and unwritten, you are talking about codification. 
there are constitutions that are written. For example, the Federal Republic of Nigeria has a written constitution, what we refer to as the 1999 constitution, because 99% of these documents are codified in a unified book called the Republic, Federal Republic of Nigerian Constitution. Therefore, you can refer to Nigerian Constitution as written. But the British Constitution is unwritten because there are a lot of laws that are not codified. There are a lot of injunctions, judgments, decisions that are based on conventions, that are based on rules, that are based on norms. Therefore, we classify Constitution into written and unwritten. Those that are codified, those that are not codified. Then you also have another classification, which is rigid and flexible. When you talk about constitution being rigid, or the rigidity of any constitution, you are talking about the procedure of amendment. For example, there are sections of Nigerian constitution as it relates to national unity that are rigid in nature because the procedure of amendment requires two thirds of both members of House of Reps and the Senate. Why there are other sections that are not rigid? So when you talk about classes of constitution or types of constitution based on rigidity and flexibility, you are only talking about the procedures of amendment. A flexible constitution does not require a rigorous procedure for amendment. Where a rigid constitution required a procedure, a difficult, a tasking for amendment. For example, the removal of a president in the office. The impeachment of a president in the office is rigid. There are processes. There are step-by-step -step stages, procedures, numbers of voting, plebiscite, lobbying that are involved in it. So therefore, it is rigid, not because of the statement or where it was written in the Constitution, but because of processes of amendment. Constitutional development in Nigeria. I've said it earlier that in this study session one, we are going to establish the foundation that the Nigerian constitution you see today does not emerge from the blues. It has metamorphosed historically from 1914 to 1999. And every amendment, every stages of development, because it's an organic document, values are being added. Issues are being raised. Questions are being asked. And that's what we call constitutional development. The face-to-face, -face, the stage-to-stage -stage growth of our national constitution. From a one-page document in 1914 to about 176 pages document in 2021. And that's what we talk about constitutional development. How do we arrive to where we are? The document we call our constitution today, how has it metamorphosed? Study session two, the Nigerian Council of 1914. On becoming the Governor General of Nigeria after the amalgamation of the Northern and Southern Protectorate in 1914, Lord Lugard established the Nigerian Council. It therefore implies that the history, the journey of Nigerian Constitution began in 1914. In this study session two, I will be exposing you to the dynamics the operationality, the composition of the first platform where issues of Nigeria were discussed. Needless to remind you that Nigeria was a pre-colonial heritage. Before 1914, there was no platform where Nigeria was mentioned. Before 1914, the Northern and the Southern Protectorate were on their own. Before 1914, there was no federation. Before 1914, there was no template, there was no platform where the north, the east, the south will come together and discuss as one. But in 1914, and that's why you see a lot of authors outside the Nigerian formation today, or the amalgamation of 1914 was an error. That the marriage of inconvenience of 1914 is the problem that leads us to where we are. But the question of today is not about looking whether the marriage was convenient or not, but what are the significance of the 1914 amalgamation? And one of the major significance of the 1914 amalgamation is the establishment of the Nigerian Council in 1914 
by the Governor General, Lord Lugard. Lugard, in his wisdom, believed that the moment we amalgamate, one of the first steps to do is to meet, to discuss that the amalgamated Southern and Northern Protectorate must begin to have a platform where issues are being raised, where issues are being discussed, where we can now interact and act, where we can now understand and explain to ourselves. So it was a platform of meetings. It was a platform where national issues have been discussed for the very first time. So 1914 Nigerian Council is so unique because it's the beginning of the constitutional development of Nigeria. Then we talk about the composition of the 1914. The constitution introduced a new legislative council, an executive council, which replaced The establishment of the Nigerian Council marked a milestone in the constitutional development of Nigeria. The council consisted of 36 members made up of 23 European officials and 13 official members, which seven of them were Europeans and six Nigerians. One important aspect of this 1914 Nigerian Council, you must know, that rather than appointing nationalists, rather than appointing educated elites, the Lugard administration decided in the wisdom to appoint traditional rulers as the non-official representative of Nigerians from the south, from the east, from the west. But unfortunately for him, these leaders could barely write. They could barely read. Then how do you discuss? They could really speak English language. So at the end of the day, it looks as if there are no concerns. Majority of the members they appointed in the first Nigerian council, let's say the first Nigerian parliament, were illiterate. So they couldn't do much. Nigerian began to complain. Nigerian began to murmur. Nigerian began to ask questions that come, look at these guys you are bringing together cannot even understand themselves. They couldn't speak English. They couldn't raise fundamental issues. They were unofficial. Their voice were not heard. And you, they didn't show any sense of commitment to the national identity which they were supposed to represent. So it was this crisis, it was this complaint, it was this agitation that made Clifford to establish the Clifford Constitution of 1922. So by 1922, Nigerians could no longer take it. There was a need for a new constitution. There was a need for a reform. There was a need for a platform where issues will be raised. So basically, the, Nigerian, the 1914 constitution collapsed because of its inability to genuinely bring Nigeria together on a platform to discuss serious issues of national development. So in study session, the next study in study session two, we are now going to the Clifford constitution of 1922. The Clifford Constitution of 1922 adopted, derived its name from the then governor of Nigeria, Sahel Clifford, who took over from former governor Lord Lugard. The Constitution introduced a new legislative council, an executive council, which replaced the abolished old legislative council of Lagos Colony and the Nigerian Council. Now, by 1922, Sahel Clifford became the governor general of Nigeria. And the first complaint he received was about the Nigerian Council of 1914. So he has no choice than now establish a new platform, a new body, where issues that concern national development will be discussed. Saho Clifford was the first in 1922 to introduce elective principles. Since Nigerians are complaining about the traditional rulers that are illiterate, why not go into electioneering? You can see the importance of constitutional development. If not for constitutional development, there won't be political parties in Nigeria. It was this elective principle that ushered in the formation of political parties and the first political party in 1923, UNDP. So constitutional development is vital in our national history. The elective principle was to bring in four Nigerians on board one representing Calabar and three from Lagos. Merits of the Clifford Constitution. The Constitution introduced elective principle 
which for the first time allow Nigerians to elect their representative into the legislative council. For the very first time, Nigerians were given the opportunity. For the very first time, Nigeria will go into balloting the way other nations are doing. For the very first time, our people have the choice to decide who will lead us, who will bear the flag, who will discuss our issues. Two, it gave special impetus to political activities, which led to the formation of political parties. One of the fundamental advantages of the Clifford Constitution was the establishment of registered political parties in Nigeria for the very first time in 1923. The political party created a platform where people could contest, where people could nominate, where act political activities were re-engineered. It was a fulfillment for Nigerian nationalists to have a platform where issues can be raised, where mobilization, political education, political orientation, political socialization could be brought to the people. It increased political agitation and awakened the spirit of nationalism which cooking Nigerian independence. It served as the first ever constitution in Nigeria. It served as the first ever where issues can now be written and be documented. Nigerians are involved. Nigerians also discuss. But sooner than later, Nigerians also began to complain. What are the problems? People felt, yes, we are being represented. But how can only four represent the entire nation? What is happening in the north? Why would the elective principle be limited to three from Lagos and one in Calabar? When we are one nation, one people, what is the rationale behind the four people being elected? Considering the majority members of this same parliament or council majorities are white, and issues to be discussed borders on Nigerians. Why not Nigerian majority in the parliament? So these are fundamental questions people were asking about the 1922 constitution. Defects of Clifford Constitution and why the Constitution was criticized. The Constitution isolated the northern provinces of Nigeria. The Constitution was a reflection of the British policy of divide and rule. The crisis of unity we have today did not begin today. The divide and rule tactics began in 1922. Why will you reflect the voices of the southern Nigeria? Why must election be limited to Lagos and Calabar? What happened to the entire region? There were serious agitation from the north. There were criticisms. There were complaints. Something is going wrong. How do you found a nation like this? If the foundation be faulty, what then will the people do? These are issues that were raised as specifically as it relates to the 1922 Clifford Constitution. Majority of Nigerians were unofficial members nominated in the Legislative Council were illiterate. The Constitution excluded Nigerian officials, non-officials in the Executive Council. Now, the study session 2, you will discover that the complaints of 1914 was addressed by 1922 Constitution. Now Nigeria has begun its complaint again on the 1922 Constitution. These complaints in 1922 Constitution were also, also addressed in 1946 Constitution. So if you follow the series, study session by study session, you will discuss that one problem leads to another. As the Constitution began to develop, Nigeria began to agitate. As we move from face to face, Nigeria began to ask questions. Nigeria began to desire for a better living, a better participation, a better involvement in the government of its own people. So in study session 3, I will be exposing you to the rudiment of the 1946 constitution, the Richard Constitution of 1946. When you complain in 1914 that you don't have elective principles, illiterates were being appointed, now election was given. You complain that the election was one-sided. The 1946 constitution was an answer to the critique, the weaknesses, the defects of 1922. Richard Constitution of 1946 replaced the defective Clifford Constitution 
1922. It was a result of the above weaknesses of the Cleaver Constitution that made Nigeria nationally to pressurize Sir Ben Ambodilon, the Governor General then, to give us a befitting constitution. The merits of Richard Constitution. Richard Constitution laid the foundation of federalism and federal constitution in Nigerian political structure. The first complaint, the first issue that was addressed by the Richard Constitution was the complaint of 1922 Constitution, the Clifford Constitution. That there is this game of divide and rule. Why will you allow electionary in the south and exclude the north? Then Richard Constitution came upon the night for and said, come, we have to address this issue. And the electoral principle, as you can see, the Constitution integrated the north with the south. By bringing the north and the south together, Richard Constitution laid the foundation for national unity. Richard Constitution then came up and said, no, in as much as there are elective principles in the south, there must also be electionary process in the north. That brought a kind of a national unity. That brought a kind of a national identity. Nigerians embraced it. Nigerians were happy. It also brought in the level of political participation. Numbers of official and unofficial members were increased. Nigerians gained a new voice. Nigerians got a new level of participation. Nigerians became happier than ever. More political parties were established. Activities of national government were now being a kind of a participatory work for all. Nigeria began to have a sense of belonging in their own nation. The constitution made Nigeria an official member majority. And for the first time, British official member became the majority in the Legislative Council in Lagos. Defect of Richard Constitution and why it was rejected by Nigerian nationalists. At a point, Nigerians also become uncomfortable. You can see the way it progresses. Nigeria was seen as a complaining nation. There was no time in the history of Nigerian constitution that Nigeria has been comfortable. Just the way the 1999 constitution is being criticized, that is lopsided, argument of derivation, argument of revenue sharing formula, argument of restructuring, contemplation on national balancing, power rotation has been all these agitations are age long. They are not today. Little was this 1946 constitution came to practice, Nigeria began to complain again. Nigeria began to ask questions. Nigeria became dissatisfied with the oppression of the 1946 constitution. It is important to note that one of the defects of the Richard Constitution was that it introduced regionalism into the Nigerian body politics, which up to today is one of the bane of Nigeria. Richard Constitution established regions. Second, government of national unity is important at Lagos, but there must be region. Regional assemblies were established. Regional House of Chiefs were established. And Nigeria became a regional champion. And that has become part of the national problem today. A northerner see himself as a northerner. A southerner see himself first as a southerner. And a westerner sees herself as a westerner. So the crisis of identity we have today, some have argued, is because or is a product of the Richard Constitution of 1946. They introduced regionalism, regional identity, ethnic coloration into the national politics of Nigeria. Then the national... The nationalists criticized and rejected the constitution because it made the native authorities and regional assemblies selection colleges instead of an electoral college. By giving reserve and veto powers to the governor, the constitution make mockery of the non-official majority of Nigerians in legislative council. Another fundamental issue to be discussed on this 1946 constitution was the question of veto powers. Powers to veto. The governor general still reserved the authority whether to accept or to reject the decision of the legislative council even when nigerians are in the majority even when majority are in the elected positions so it's, it's, it's questionable nigerians became dissatisfied they said no veto power must go 
What is the essence of a legislative assembly that has no power? What is the essence of a parliament that cannot take decisions? The constitutional conferences were held in many parts of the country where the people discussed about the new constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, you will discover that the Nigerian nationalist leaders seriously criticized and subsequently rejected the constitution because they were not consulted during the drafting. One of the major problems of the Richard Constitution was the issue of consultations. Nigeria began to ask questions. We were not consulted. We were not asked. There was no referendum. There was no plebiscite that we need a new constitution. Sir Richard came on board as Governor General and imposed this constitution on us. Then Nigeria became dissatisfied. Nigeria became disillusioned. And many begin to ask questions. Many begin to ask, why with this? So there was a need for a new constitution. There was a need for a reform. There was a need for an amendment in major areas of the constitution. So ladies and gentlemen, you will discover from study session one, where we discuss the foundation of constitution and constitutionalism. Lest I forget, please let me state this. There is a great difference between constitution and constitutionalism. Why constitution is a ground norm, a body of rules, guidelines that guide the operation of states. Constitutionalism is the workability, the practicability, the functionality of any constitution. Is the constitution workable? Is it acceptable? Is it functional? Can it really drive the people forward? That's what when we talk about constitutionalism, we talk about the functionality, the workability, the functionality of any constitution and its acceptability. And you will discover from the 1922 constitution, from the Nigerian Council of 1914 to Richard Constitution of 1946, this constitution were generally not acceptable. This constitution were generally not functional. This constitution were generally not workable. And these are the issues we will be raising. Ladies and gentlemen, study session one, study session two has established a foundation for constitutional development. How Nigerian constitutional metamorphosis. In the next study session, we'll be introducing you to 1951 McPherson Constitution, which will give a bigger background, a periscope of exactly what to expect. Thank you for listening.